Chapter 18 The Box of Cakes The incident of the ivory abacus got into a blind alley. Shunsuke and Otami made quite opposite guesses about it, but both of them grieved that their son was not naive for his age. When Jiro and his little brother met each other, they thought of the case respectively, but neither of them let it out in words. It always turned in Jiro's favor. To fight his brothers to his heart's content had been Jiro's idea for a long time, but they were no longer his enemies to defeat. He was a little disappointed, but was not very sorry for that. He was rather glad that he could play with them more intimately than before. Kyoichi was fond of reading, so grandmother often bought him books and magazines. He sometimes gave Jiro the old books he was through with. Jiro was very pleased to read them. At first, he was interested only in the illustrations, but gradually turned turned to reading the articles too. Once in a while, he discussed with his brother what he had read, each lying on his side on the floor. Jiro was influenced by his sensitive brother to some good purpose. With his younger brother, he could not gain much intimacy, but after the abacus incident, they often played together in the garden and the field. Jiro was satisfied that Shunzo hardly complained to him these days. As a result, he would not go out to play with his friends very often. Otami was very pleased with his change, thinking that her educative power had come to influence him at last. It was a much less chance not to be lost. She made approaches to Jiro as often as she could though it was annoying to the boy. She did not scold him very much, but even praised him at times. In this way, his impression of his mother was also changing little by little. Toward his grandmother, however, Jiro could not feel any favor at all. At mealtime, she would favor his brothers, but Otami tried to be as fair as possible to all of them all the three children. She did not treat him discriminately at the table like grandmother. The wicked old woman would put him aside on purpose from his brothers whenever Otami was not present. Why don't you have your fish, Jiro? said grandmother one day. I don't like it, he said, seeing his fish much smaller than his brothers. How strange! You're eating a lot of rice, aren't you? Her ironical words killed his interest in the meal completely. Oh my, you're going to stop your rice too. I don't feel like eating very much, grandmother, he said. You have stomach ache or something, she said, but Jiro did not answer, at a loss what to say. Then she said, I see, you're angry again, eh? Nothing like that, he said, but his face told his feelings clearly. Gazed at by a lot of cynical eyes, he could not help leaving the dining table with a determined face. My goodness, said grandmother scornfully, following him with her cold eyes. What an ill-natured boy he is. Leave him alone, said someone sarcastically. Make him learn to be twisted as he likes. When Jiro was playing with his brothers merrily in the garden, grandmother would sometimes call Kyoichi and Shunzo to give them sweets and other goodies. How angry and distressed Jiro felt with her discriminating treatment. But he neither wanted the old woman to think that he was craving for it nor liked her to notice that he was hurt by her cold treatment. He made every effort to look calm, which was very painful to Jiro, an unyielding, unyielding boy. 
Each time he had to control his indignant feelings with great difficulty, and the black fire of anger was burning violently in his heart. It might explode at any moment. You can get used to almost everything in the world, but it is definitely impossible to be used to being discriminated, isn't it? The more you are exposed to discrimination, the colder you look at the hotter your blood boils and the hotter your blood boils in anger. One day, Jiro happened to see grandmother enter her room with a small box of cakes. Probably she had come back from a religious meeting. She was clothed in her kimono with a formal coat on top. As usual, she would give the cakes to Kyoichi and Shunzo alone, he thought. He could no longer put up with that old woman's treatment. He had rarely visited her room, but that day, as soon as she left, he stole into it. The box was placed on the shelf next to the abacus. He grabbed it and carried it to the vegetable garden at the back. He was tempted to open it and look inside, but stopped. Instead, he threw it down with, his, with all his might and stamped on it again and again to his heart's content. Some pinkish paste oozed out of the box. Jiro pictured himself pounding grandmother's face. After some time, the old woman came back and found the box gone. What the fuss she made? All the family looked for it in excitement. Jiro, Jiro, they cried out. They cried, but he was already high up in the ginkgo tree by the bathroom, looking down at the excited people. It was now Kichi who found the shattered box. When he made a scream, all the others rushed to the backyard. What a horrible thing, exclaimed Otami. Shunsuke stood behind with his arms folded. He seemed to be deep in thought. Dear me, what a waste this is, said Oito and picked up the flattened box. It could not be saved at all, so she threw it away studying the old mistress. When all the people started for the main house, grandmother happened to turn to the ginkgo tree. My goodness, she cried out to see Jiro's wooden clogs at the root of the tree. Jiro knew too late that he had made a mistake. Bring me a bamboo pole now, Kitty, quick, she said, looking up at Jiro with a horrible face. He was confused, but the next moment slipped down like a monkey and dashed into the garden. Go and catch him now, Kichi. Don't be loose with him for once, Shusuke. She exclaimed and ran after Jiro. He swiftly ran through the shrubbery and jumped onto the veranda of the drawing room. There was a small altar room between the room and the dining room. It was dark even in the daytime unless lit by a candle. He jumped in it. He, he jumped in to hide himself. As he held his breath, the damp scent of the incense drifted into his nostrils. Where has he gone? said grandmother in a gasping voice as she stepped into the dark altar room. Soon she began to chant Namu Amidabutsu, Namu Amidabutsu, as usual. Just then, Jiro drew his legs to make himself as small as possible, and lo, grandmother stumbled over them and lost her footing and fell down on the floor. Oh, help, quick, she cried. In the meantime, Jiro sprang up and dashed out. He fled back to the garden like a bouncing ball. Who did he see there? It was his father. He was standing there in silence with his arms folded as before. Come with me, said Shunsuke. 
in great fear, Jiro followed his father. They went upstairs to a gloomy room and sat face to face with each other. Shunsuke was sitting before Jiro silently. Jiro moved his knees nervously at first but could not bear it any longer and started to weep. Shunsuke also rubbed his own eyes with his palm. In about an hour, they came down. Grandmother and Otami had never seen Shunsuke so tense they could not utter a word to him but exchanged glimpses with each other. Chapter 19 Removal of the School Building It had long been a subject of conversation among the villagers that the school building was too old and dangerous, and recently a new one was being built by the big river several hundred meters to the east from the present school. There was a big wooden bridge with railings across it, and a thick cedar grove was seen on the, dark, on the other bank. Day after day, the school children looked out of the windows in excitement to see how the new pillars were erected and shining against the dark cedar grove. The new school is going to be wonderful, they said. After school, Jiro often visited the carpenter's workshop with his friends to watch them working. They also played with the strewn pieces of wood. Among other things, however, he always wondered where Ohama's room would be. He asked the working men quite often, but they could not tell him exactly where it would be set. Toward the end of the year, the long-awaited school building was finally completed. Jiro visited and scrutinized every room, but could not get any idea which one would be for the keeper's family. There was a three-matted room with an earthen floor. It might be their room, but looked too small for them. And next to it was a spacious matted room separated by a wall. A nice alcove was set to it, which seemed too good for their family. Just one day before the winter vacation set in, the students from the third grade and over were assigned to carry the things to the new building after school. It was a pleasant work for them, such as they had never experienced before. The merry and noisy parade of the students went along by the muddy truck, carrying blackboards, chairs, cleaning tools, and so on. Jiro was told by his teacher to carry only a chair and a broom before he went home. He was not satisfied with that job. He wished to join the melee of senior boys carrying heavy things like blackboards. After he was through with his role, he went to the keeper's room to help Ohama. What he saw there was an empty room. Not a single broom could be seen. He found Ohama sitting by herself on the step to the tatami room. She looked absent-minded, supporting her chin with her hands on the knees. She recognized him and said, in a weak voice. Oh, master, are you finished already? Yes, I am, he said. Let me carry your things. Oh, you'll help me? But we have nothing to carry anymore. Just have a look, master. How quick you are. Yes, master, we certainly are. Did you take them away today? No, we made it yesterday. That's why you were so quick, Ohama. Maybe so, master. The new school building is so beautiful, isn't it? said Jiro. Yes, it is. Where's your room, Ohama? I looked for it but couldn't find. Oh dear, did you look for it? she said. But you won't be able to find it there. 
No kidding. Yes, I'm serious, Master. We are not school keepers anymore. You're kidding, aren't you? But it's true, my dear. Is it all right not to have a keeper at school? He said. I was told the school will have a new janitor. A janitor? He said. Then why don't you be one, Ohama? But I can't. A woman can't be a janitor. How absurd! So your father is going to be one, isn't he? said Jiro. No, they said he was too old, said Ohama with a lonesome face. Nonsense, he cried. Then who's going to take over? Didn't you see the man? said Ohama. I suppose he was over there. Jiro remembered seeing a short, middle aged man moving about busily in the new building. He wore a close buttoned coat. He must have been the new janitor. All of a sudden, the new school building seemed to be a disgusting place which had been so attractive till then. Once again, Jiro looked around the old keeper's room at the dirty walls, the floor, and everything else. The white plaster below the cross piece. Had long had a part broken off as if a human's head were drooping. Today it looked a little bigger to him. There was a knot hole in a board of a ceiling of the ceiling into which he would stick a bamboo stick whenever the rats made a noise. A sooty cobweb was still seen hanging from the ceiling. A lot of sweet memories returned to him as he looked at those things. Filled with nostalgia, he wished to frown upon his nurse again as he used to, but it was broken by the noises the teachers and senior students were making. Where's your father? asked Jiro, moving closer to Ohama. He's not here. They all left yesterday, dear, she said. Jiro remembered that Otsuru had been absent from school for a few days. Where have, all, have they all gone? he said. Far away, Master, she said. They've gone to a coal mining town. You've never been to such a place, have you? Are you going there too? said Jiro anxiously. Ah, uh, yes, she said in tear tears. But Jiro-chan, you don't have to go there, he said. You can stay with us. I'll ask my father, so please. How do you think it possible, Jiro-chan? said Ohama. Your mother and grandmother won't say yes. By the way, master, I was told you troubled grandmother very much some days ago. It's kind of you, but your father won't be able to say yes. Besides, Jiro-chan... You'll be all right even if I'm not with you, won't you? But I, he faltered. Ohama regained her usual strictness and told him in a pressing tone. No, Jiro-chan, you mustn't be so weak. I'm not weak, he said, excited. He wanted to tell her that he had not been beaten by his brothers recently but didn't have any idea how to express himself. Really? she said. I'm relieved to hear that, but please don't be rough with grandmother. You'll have your father scold you again. But I don't like grandmother. But isn't she your grandmother? said Ohama. If you do such a thing again, your father will get really angry with you. Father didn't say anything to me, he said. Really? How about your mother? She didn't say anything either. Oh, said Ohama in bewilderment. Yes, it's true, said Jiro. Mother isn't so hard on me these days. I'm glad to hear that, she said. It's because you've become a good boy, Jiro-chan. Jiro was a little embarrassed and said, the other day, mother bought me a picture book. Ohama remembered what she had been told by grandmother Masaki. She said, 
It seems Otami has changed her attitude for the better. I'm sure of it. She felt light-hearted and stroked Jiro on the head, nodding to herself. Please go home, Jiro-chan, she said. I have to visit the Masakis first, then I'll come to your house. If your mother says yes, I'll sleep beside you tonight. Ohama and Jiro rose up hand in hand. As they passed by the gate, they stopped as if it had been prearranged and turned back to look up at the old building. The last group of the students had already left and the big silhouette of the village school stood in complete silence in the burning afterglow.